The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Hope Housing is championing the great Aussie dream for our everyday heroes, police, nurses, paramedics, teachers and more by reinventing the way they buy homes. Hope's shared equity housing model means your clients can now access the property investment returns they've come to love without the hassle of being a landlord and at the same time enabling affordable home ownership for a deserving frontline worker. It's the win-win Australia needs right now. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I have the pleasure of speaking with Connell Keneary today. Uh, we're just saying, well, I was just saying to you, Connell, before I press record, normally I'll do a bit of an intro of kind of who you are and what you're up to, but I've got a few different things going on. Um, I thought I might throw to you and you give us your intro about the different businesses and things that you've got and what you're up to at the moment. Easy. Th- thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard. When I answer the phone and I'm saying, hey, this is Connell from... You know what I say next is not always the easiest thing. So we have an advice practice, um, which is what if advice. We have two. We run two different AFSLs, so Cobalt and Beryllium Advisors, um, and then we also have the Advisor Games, which is like an advisor events based uh, business. So yeah, we're we're up to a few things at the moment. Yeah, and so two two licenses. That's interesting. What. What's the difference? We'll get into the licensing in a bit more detail later yep. on. But what's the difference between the two licenses that you're running? What's, what's that about? Um, look, they're very, very. They are very similar. Um, in a lot of ways, they are um, parallel to each other. Um, there's a few different authorization differences, but um, yeah, we um, had a choice to change the authorization of one license or get a second license. It was just a few internal strategic reasons why we did it. And think of it like brother sister licenses, you know. They, they are all intertwined. Whenever we do things, we speak to all the advisors as a whole. And yeah, we just like going through the periodic table. <laughs> and so you you mentioned advisor games. I, I I didn't actually realize before you mentioned that you were behind uh, all, all of that. My, my LinkedIn feed last week was uh, was full of posts of financial advisors and others seemingly running around the city uh, doing something up to some challenge. What what was that? What was that all about? Can you tell us? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so we, you know, we're, we are advisors running our own business, running our license, and I think the theme that you'll get from us as we do just look at things with fresh eyes and from the perspective of the advisor. Um, so, you know, last year we did a PD day for our advisors, and we thought, hey, let's try and make this, you know, unique and interesting. But it was still a bunch of people sitting in a room staring at slides. You know, yeah, we had some trivia, we had some fun fit elements to it, but it still had that same format. So, this year, we're like, what can we do different? Um, we sat down and asked the advisors, well, what do you want out of these kind of advisor gets together? And the overwhelming response was advisors want to speak to other advisors. They want to know about their business. They want to have that peer interaction. We then went and talked to BDMs and said, hey, what do you want out of these you know, um, industry events? And they wanted genuine interaction with advisors. Like, they don't necessarily want to be standing up talking in front of slides. They want to be speaking one-on-one and knowing people's names. Um, so then from that, we're like, great, what can we do? And it just evolved into this advisor games. This one was the amazing race. So it was 50 advisors, 10 teams, five people per team. Um, and we had nine stops, which were the sponsors. So they started here in the office, got a clue, found the next stop, got to the first stop, which was, let's say, Morningstar. They then had to navigate a challenge at that stop. And then once they finished the challenge, they get the next clue to go to the next place. Um, and yeah, it was a full day event and it went ridiculously well. I was kind of shocked by how well it went, um, how much fun the advisors had, how much fun the BDMs have. You know, you do one of these events and you just don't know, like, are the advisors going to go, eh, too hard, I'm going to the pub? Um, <laughs> or, you know, do one or two stops and, you know, you just disappear as, you know, we've all known to do at some of these events. But no, it was the opposite. They were literally sprinting out the door. So much so that the day went quicker than I was expecting. Like my timings for the day across 
you know, 10 stops, et cetera, they went faster than I was expecting them to do. They were that enthusiastic. Yeah, maybe it says something about the uh, kind of the personality traits of an advisor. There's maybe a bit of competitiveness in them and it's, you know, I want to win this thing even though it's that it doesn't necessarily mean anything, anything. I still want to win this thing and off I go. A hundred percent. The second we said go, we caught and recorded like a video here in the office, which was like the games master saying, hey, these are your instructions, go. And I think as soon as it said go, that competitive side kind of, you know, snapped on and uh, they were off. And then even at the dinner that night, you know, we gave away, you know, prizes and first place. People kept coming up to me saying, can I see the scorecards? I want to know where we went and how much do we miss it by? And so, I need to actually release the scores. I'll put them on LinkedIn soon. Yeah. So, what what was the scoring element behind it? What what was that about? Okay. So, it was, think of it like time. So, how long does it take you to travel from point A to point B? That's your time. And then at the first stop, how you perform gives you a score and that takes time off your total time, if that makes any sense. So, there was that. And then the third scoring element was posting on LinkedIn. So, if you take a photo of the sponsor of your team and post it on LinkedIn, you get one bonus point. Again, I was expecting people to do a few. There ended up being 500 posts, 150,000 impressions on LinkedIn. So, again, that went a bit crazier than we were expecting. Yeah, so there was a, I, I didn't pay too much attention to the individual people posting, but yeah, if I, I you know, opened up my LinkedIn feed a couple of times on, on the day that you were doing it and... Uh, yeah, this, you know, different, the same person was checking in here and then checking in here and checking in here at, at different stops. So that worked well. With, like with the, the purpose behind it, was that just really to get the advisors to you know, give them some some maybe a little bit more relaxed environment to, to talk amongst each other? Like it's not a CPD yeah. type, type event? N- not, not, not so much. It is so of the 50 advisors, 30 of them were our advisors and then 20 were from external. So I think there's a bunch of these. Um, advisors out there that do get lost in the industry. Maybe it's a self-licensed firm and they've got two or three advisors that just don't have that same connection to the to the rest of the industry. So, we sometimes just do drinks in the office and invite local advisors to come have a drink. Um, so, it's a bit more community building than anything else. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know and, and meeting different people. Um, when I was creating the teams, it was a bit like organizing a wedding where you're trying to put the right people within the right teams and... Um, you know, yeah, I, I, people, lots of people came up to me and said, you know, I just spent six hours with these people I never would have otherwise. I never would have spoken to them otherwise. And they are now like a, a contact that I have for life. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the point. I, I if, if you don't already, I reckon you'll have like a, a wait list for, for the next one that, that you do. Whether yeah. it's on the sponsorship so doing, side or on the advisor side. On the day, we got emails from both sides because um, they saw all the activity. So, the next one we're doing is in Melbourne on the 7th of March and then we're going to do Sydney two weeks later on the 21st of March. Um, this first one was a bit of a trial where, um, yeah, we'll do those in- I literally just Googled what's the best month for weather in Melbourne and that's how we picked March. <laughs> um, and then there's other things. So, Advisor Games is the is the headline. These are amazing races, but there's plenty of other stuff we can do. Charity Poker, Advisor Olympics. I've got a bunch of ideas or we have a bunch of ideas for- other things. There's there's a there's a like a standalone business just in that, isn't there? Right, you know, running these little bit more social events um, for for advisors that, as you said, feel feel somewhat lost. And I guess that's a bit of part of the ensemble community as well. You know, by and large, it's it's people that are in fairly small practices that are part of the, the community and uh, just another yeah. means to get them together. Because like they you know networking drinks and a BDM puts on some drinks and. Yeah, there's there's the normal conference thing where you sit there and you, as you said, you listen to all these slides and then and then they say, oh, there's some networking drinks at the end. No one sticks around. You get four or five people and then everyone just disappears. So hundred percent. But even like I'm a fairly extroverted person. I'm happy to just kind of go up and say g'day to somebody. But even at those events, you speak to the person to your left, to your right, and that's about it. Correct. You know, if there's somebody on the other side of the room, you're never going to even know they were there. Um, so I think you're right. The ensemble community is fantastic, and I push a lot of people to that. But it's, it is very online. I, I think it's just there is also an element of more face to face stuff, which again sure. you guys do. But just getting, and especially locally, like I've said to a lot of advisors, jump on the advisor register, see which advisors live local to you, and say let's catch up for a coffee. Yeah, I would say by and large, advisors are very open to catching up and having a chat and making connections, um, because every advisor has something to give to another advisor whether it's experience or tech or strategy or whatever it is, 
there's so much collaboration in this industry and I don't think we're competing against each other. It's inter- it's interesting you comment on that 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 you know advisors being local to you. I went to a uh, like it was a a product CPD type session uh, not not far from my house. I don't, I don't live too far away from Essendon Airport down here in, yep. in, in Melbourne, and um, it, it was the, it was the first it was the first time one of these uh, you know, product manufacturers or something had done an event in this particular location. That there's a there's a hotel at, at Essendon Airport, uh, and and they'd done it there. And just because it was local, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to go. I'll work from home that day and and go along. And uh, there was turns out there was one one of the dads from school that I happened yeah. to bump into a few weeks earlier, and turned out he was a financial advisor. Otherwise, it I wouldn't have known. That, you know, yep. but, and so it, it was. I don't know. It felt better going to something s- smaller, kind of closer to home. There's a bit of a strip of local shops, and there's some lawyers and accountants and things ne- nearby. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I work in the city primarily, and those events are full of people in their suits, and they go in and they get their thing, and then they disappear. It was. It, there was a lot more chatter in in just that local event, and there was probably only thirty or forty people. There it was a fairly small event, but yeah, you're right. There's something to be said for the community is super the community powerful. Based um, ones. Yeah, even just things like who else can I refer to in the in the local area? Who's a good accountant? Who's good this? Who's good that? Or we go to the same school, or we know the same sporting clubs. There is a lot of power in that, and that's kind of what we say to some of the new advisors joining the license. You know, we're trying to grow leads and grow their business. We just sort of say get involved in the community. Yeah, now that's maybe a good yep. intro segue into into the licensing part of of, of what you're up to. So you know, we briefly caught up at the ensemble event in in Sydney a, li- a little while back, and we were, we were chatting about a lot of people that I talk to as part of the podcast, and just general comments through through the community around you know, the small businesses. There might be one or two people, maybe they've got some support staff. More often than not, those support staff are overseas. And you know, there's, there's some challenges that some of these smaller businesses face, and then you know, a, a number of them eventually get to a point where it's too hard for 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 some particular reason. I'm going to sell into some other group and roll the business into there and be part of a part of a bigger group. How, how are you? How are you seeing that playing out from from your side, from that licensee side, and and what are you doing in that space? Yeah, so th- there there's a lot to unpack in just that question. Um, so maybe I'll kind of just tell you what we do and then just some of the solutions to some of that stuff. Um, so like we've said, we're advisors. We created a dealer group with the advisor in mind and also the end client in mind. So even just those perspectives are a little different. We have an maybe an evolutionary licensing options. So there's like a startup option that we have and kind of what you're just saying. So someone to transition from being employed to self-employed is really, really difficult. So, salaries are getting higher and higher as a uh, financial advisor. So, to go from that to potentially $0 income and then three, four, five grand out every month in business expenses, that's a really huge jump. Um, we have seen advisors try it and not succeed and it's pretty painful to see when they go into that traditional licensing model. There's various reasons of why that happens, but one of the licensing we options we have is a hybrid approach between kind of employed and self-employed where it's somewhere in the middle um, of those two so that um, it's more of a tippy, uh, you know, putting your toe into the water of being self-employed. Um, I can go into more detail about what that is, but we have that. We then have traditional licensing, which is a fixed fee option, and then we have like a self-licensing option. So, effectively, someone starting at zero and then going up to a million dollars worth of revenue, there's a different kind of option for each of those business types. But yeah, that narrative of how hard it is to be an advisor, especially a single advisor in a business, is difficult. And I think also you can get trapped on a license or in a particular advisor group and you don't see what else is out there. Um, you don't know what other options you've got. So, you know, your licensee turns around and says, hey, your licensing fees are $60,000 a year right now and your business is no longer viable. You think that's fact, but that's just not necessarily the case. Yeah. Yeah. So, what so what does that transition look like for you? So, I, I step out of here, as you said, I go from a nice salary to zero. Mm-hmm. I have no clients. I'm yep. starting from starting from scratch. Yep. All of a sudden, I'm supposed to pay a licensing fee and all of these outgoings to get the business set yep. up in the first place. So, hopefully, I've got some resources behind me to cover that for a brief period of time. But then if you start yeah. setting yourself into a some, some monthly outgoings, you're going to have to have a few clients coming on board just to cover your outgoings, let alone pay your salary. So, what does that first yeah. what does that first step so, look like? So, so there's two there's two options. So let's call it um, the startup 
licensing option and the traditional licensing front. Did I'll, I'll let me explain what that looks like in the startup option first, and then yes. I'll explain the what it looks like the other one. So Let's do that. If you look at an established business, an established financial planning business, they have a lot of things. They have a brand. They have a website. Maybe they have an office. They probably have lots and lots of leads. And a business like that can take on an employee, but they take on 100% of the risk and they pay 100% of the salary. So the risk is very much in the business side. Um, how we look at it is if you want to come into our business, you can use our brand. There's no ongoing expenses. There's no ongoing stuff. We even have leads that we can give you. But if you service those leads, we own the client. So it's um, for better purposes, let's call it a, a percentage model um, between the two. However, what that advisor can do is they can take our leads, service their clients, you know, replace their income very, very quickly. But on the other side of the coin, they can start building up their client book. So if they go and find their own lead, go and find their own client, they own that client 100%. What that means is that whether it's a, you know, a year or two years, then when they're transitioning into a traditional licensing model, they're bringing a book with them and they're not starting at zero. That kind of makes sense? Yep, it does. Yep. And, and so the, the clients that, that you own in that model, they when they go and do their own thing, they those clients stay with you, your business. It's up to it's up yep. to it's up to the advisor. So do you yep. want to you know buy them off of us? Buy them, keep the clients, mm-hmm. or do you want to leave them with us and we can give them to another advisor? It, we're it's more about what the advisor wants than what we want per se, because either way it doesn't matter. Then, because it's on the same license, it's very easy as well. They're not really changing licenses; they're just changing branding more than anything yeah. else. Um, you know, so we have transitioned an advisor recently in that model. You know, he came to us with not not a lot. He had a goal of trying to get to ten thousand dollars per month in ongoing revenue of his own clients. Got to that, he moved across. He didn't take any of our clients with him. He just wanted his own clients. Um, but he then means that he's at ten grand per month when he's in that standard licensing world. Yeah. And the other part to this is other our licensing, we're trying to help the rest of our businesses in our licenses grow. So this is an alternate option as well for them if they want to add an extra advisor into their business. They're trying to grow because you have the same problem on the other side. Do you go and buy, get like employee advisor and, and spend the hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year? What like that's very scary for a small business owner as well. So the the question then is what other options do they have? This hybrid option is also something they can do. So that's interesting. So you could have a, a completely standalone business that's doing its own thing, operating on your uh-huh. license, paying the normal yep. fees, whatever whatever they are. But then to try and bridge that gap between how do I go from one advisor to two advisors? Because to your point, all of a sudden they have to pay this person one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in salary and whatever other costs yep. that are going to go with it. You'd want to have you'd either want to have a decent client book to be able to support that, or a lot of leads coming through. One combination of both. But you can mm-hmm. do that you know, revenue splitting, whatever it, whatever it is, that, that hybrid model to get them up yeah. and running until they then come across. That's interesting. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's just more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. Um, and I think that – now, this is very much focused on like the, the way that we got here. I was seeing these people who were willing to go the traditional route. They were willing to t- get rid of their salary. They were willing to put the, their life on the line and try this whole self-employed thing. That's the type of person I'm, we're looking at. That, that's this is for. It's not for the employee servicing advisor style. I just want to turn up to work nine to five. It's someone who's trying to build something, and then having that personality type in your business is also the personality type that you want. Someone who's you know, is trying to grow. They want to be a small business owner. Um, you get they, they're an asset to the business. Yeah, and then I noticed on on the website for for your licensing business, then then there's a then there's a self licensed element as well. So, if someone's operating their own yeah. license, you can support them in some way. What, what's that like? What's that about? Yeah. Well, let, let's go the next step first. Sorry, James. Yeah. Let's say so that's the standard option, the the, yep. the startup option, and let's go to, to, to traditional licensing. Sure. I think that what we then did was we looked at standard licensing and said, how do we kind of fix the problems that we had in the past? So, little thing is like, you know, fixed licensing fees, um, just trying to change the power dynamic. Not everyone has had this experience, but AFSLs can be bullies on for, for, on a money orientation, on a compliance point of view, on so many elements. We try to just try to change some of that. And the other part is that they want help in their business. So when you have these single advisors who are out trying to run a business and they have questions like, where do I get extra leads from? Should I spend money on Google Ads? How do I get staff overseas? How do I, what tech can I use? What should my proposal software look like? You know, most AFSLs don't have those answers. 
well, we have a fully functioning advice business that we can go, hey, we're not saying that we're the best at everything, but if you want to look under the hood and see what we're doing and seeing what software we're getting, you can have every piece of knowledge that we have. You know, you're welcome to it. Um, and then that's where that community inside the licenses kind of grows. Um, so there's that. And that the next the third option is that self licensing. And it's not for everyone. If you ask a lot of advisors, the idea of being self licensed is a bit scary. And what advisors like is the dealer group model where someone's doing the pay, someone's doing the compliance, someone's doing everything, but you do lose a little bit of control. You are still at the behest of another license, kind of like an SMSF, right? With an SMSF, you get additional control, but you get additional responsibility. Um, our self-licensing model is very much a, it, it looks like the license you've just been on, the policies are the same, the process are the same, but it's ultimately your license. Therefore, you can do the, make the ultimate decisions and the money goes into your bank account. It's, it's, it's a um, dealer group style of self-licensing. Good chat. And what made you yeah. go down this route of of starting the licensing business in the first place? Like, were you, were you operating your own financial planning business first and then you, I don't know, had some issues yeah. with licensing, whatever it might have been, and then you've gone, like, what, what was the story behind that? Um, it's just really interesting as an advisor, when you ask questions around self-licensing, the responses you get back are very often incorrect. I remember someone telling me, ASIC's not giving out licenses anymore, and if you do, it's going to cost you 100 grand. Nope. That's how can, how can they not be handing out licenses and and it's going to cost me a hundred grand? It makes no sense. And this guy was an actual lawyer in the industry. So you go down this research of well, what other options do you have? Like we're advisors, we're looking at for I don't know a different super fund for your client. You go and do the research. We just went and did the research around self licensing versus dealer group model, and it just worked for us. We we are very much let's do it a bit different and do it our way. And I think for that dial of business owner, self licensing does work. It is not for everyone. Much like an SMSF is not for everybody, self-licensing is not for everyone. Yep. And so, how long have you operated the, the licensee business? Oh, 2019, I think. I need to check. My, my, my dates aren't great, but yeah, 2019, I'd say. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. so, then maybe if we then talk about the the, the financial advice business, kind of okay, working back to, to maybe where it began, yep. talk us through you know, what if advice and what does the business structure look like? And we'll kind of get into some of your clients and things. Yeah. So, um, again, it's that same theme of trying to do something different. You know, we wanted a, an advice business that didn't use the word wealth or wealth protection or wealth, any of that sort of stuff. So, you know, what if advice was very much that, you know, what if you can retire early? What if you can do this? So, we kind of started from that base. I was living in Melbourne at the time. So, I was what if advice Melbourne, Ben, my business partner, who is- 50% across everything we're talking about. He's the other side to this coin. He was in Brisbane and yeah, we were just running our businesses, you know, kind of separately. But it is something that I do say to advisors is if you are starting out, having another advisor in your business can be very beneficial. You can share business costs. Um, different personality types are better and worse at different things. Having just someone else to bounce ideas off of is um, very, very beneficial for so- people who are self-employed and sitting there by themselves. And you can do the structure, even have two different companies and one brand. Like you can still be separate, but together. So I think that's probably why it was easier for us to go from having our own business and to go into our own license was every step of the way, it was 50% of the expense and 50% of the effort because it was two of us. Um, so definitely made it easier. Mm-hmm. Inside What If Advice right now, um, the same thing you'd always say, you know, holistic advice, um, real advice, strategic advice, all that, you know, that that sort of stuff. The fact that it is our license does make it a bit easier. I think AFSLs hide things from advisors. Uh, No, you have to do an SOA for everything or you have to, you know, everything needs to go into an SOA or you have to do foundation SOAs. Oh, $15,000 where you don't need an SOA for investment. No, 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 that's not a thing. You have to do an SOA. Like, because they're trying to mitigate their risk, they really push advisors down one direction. But that's just not the case. You know, sometimes there is strategic advice. Sometimes it's not product advice. Sometimes th- there's certain things you can do to make your experience and the client's experience better. And it's just yeah, interesting people's um, translation of the legislation. Hmm. How, how did how did you and Ben come together? If, if you were in Melbourne and he was in Brisbane, how did that come about? So I actually was living in a Brisbane at the time, but we did the AP Horizons um, course. So I met Ben and my wife. On the same day in Sydney, doing the AP Horizons, um, <laughs> I then um, 
came back to Br- Brisbane and we did the AAP thing and, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, I moved to Melbourne for, for work, but obviously it was for her. And, uh, yeah, I stayed there for six years, um, got married, had our first kid in those COVID lockdowns, which was horrendous. Yeah. And then uh, you, you find yourself scrolling realestate.com and ended up back here and bought a house and bought the office and, yeah, haven't looked back. Yeah, nice. Good on you. Good on you. So, are you are you spending much time like in terms of the advice business? Are you advising many clients? Like, it sounds like you're doing a lot of different things. Are you completely no. out of being a, an advisor? What's your day to day? So, I would the way I would describe it is I spend 140 percent of my time on the licenses, and then another 30 percent of my time uh, probably working on the advice business rather in, than in the advice business. You know, we have a tech stack that every single stage is you know, digital and we try to automate it as much as possible. We're going through another whole process where we think we can go from six or seven apps down to one app. So, that's a, a process we're going through right now. Um, but no, the, the the seeing clients and really being a good advisor and be able to service clients properly, you, you kind of need to have your head in the game 100%. So, yeah, it's been a few years now that we've kind of stepped away from that. Yeah. And so, what have you got in terms of a team of advisors then in the business? Uh so, what have we got now? So, yeah, we've got two in Brisbane and two in Melbourne. And I think we'll add another one or two in January into the what is advice environment. Yep. And is that, is that to just deal with uh, new new client inquiries and, and, and leads yep. that are coming through? Yeah. Yeah, we get heaps of leads. Um, like, as time goes by in an advice business, the, the funnels in which you get leads from, it just grows. And then as you have more clients, there's more referrals and it just it does just grow. We only put on another advisor when we have too many leads. Like you, you can't, there needs to be an abundance of leads first, and then you put that other advisor on. Um, but yeah, I'd say by January, February, we'll be at that stage again. Yep. And where do they? Where are they coming from? Where where's the abundance coming from? Client referrals, Facebook community groups, Google ads, social media. Like I did six YouTube videos four years ago, and we still get leads from that. Yeah. Um, so. It, yeah, I think it's just activity, correct activity. They were, you know, I've seen a couple of your videos and you, for a little while there, you were putting some videos on LinkedIn as well. They were they were high quality. You were using a good camera and you had the lighting set up. And Yeah. I don't know whether um, you did it yourself or someone did it did it with you, but that, they I, were high I quality. I did it all myself um, yeah. and it's just time consuming. So, you know, doing the, like you always spend a year researching how to record, how to edit, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, especially on advice, like on on these topics like advice and on licensing, you don't want to get it wrong. Like we're just having a chat, which is totally fine. You can tell I'm chatting. If you're gonna put yourself out there and say, and you know what I'm talking about, you do it yourself. You just kind of want to cross your eyes and dot your t's to just make sure you're not stuffing up concessional contributions or tripping over your words. It's so it's time consuming. And I, if I was gonna do it again, and I, I probably will, I would go for a quicker approach. Yeah, I was writing scripts. I had a teleprompter. Uh, I was editing it all myself. Yeah. yeah. Did you have Too to much. go out and buy all the gear or did you have all of that? Was it a bit of, you know, photos and video, a bit of a hobby for you to begin with? No, I I, I think I have a hobby of spending money. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, no. And I think a lot of it comes to back to stress and anxiety and it's about trying to reduce that. So, for me, it was if I can do good quality stuff, then I'm less anxious about putting those videos out there. And it's so easy in hindsight for me to go, oh, it's not necessary. Um but I get it and why other advisors are hesitant to do video. I think that they're wrong and they should do more video, but um, I, I can get up in front of 100 people and talk and not care. When I was in that little office pressing record, I, I was not feeling good. So, I'm the, I'm the other way. I, I Like I'm sitting in a room by myself as we're recording this. I I would quite happily sit in front of it, like even if it was a full get up full I'd just use my phone to record but if it was even a full setup I'd be more than happy to sit here talking about whatever I was talking about but the opposite way to get up on stage in front of 100 people and say that same thing I'd be nervous as anything so I, I think it's like where your brain goes like when I'm yeah. looking down the barrel of the camera I'm seeing the unlimited number of people across the YouTube world <laughs> where when you're sitting in front of 100 people, I can just look at that person and I can look at that person and my brain just goes into this conversational style where on video, I don't know what it is, I I could record the first half fine and then I would just go to nowhere and I can't, words won't come out of my mouth. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm interested in something you, you mentioned before about 
kind of automating your advice process and there's six different apps and trying to bring that down to one like it is are, are you using some off the shelf things that anyone else can use is this something some things you've built yourself or yes. what's that look like so the current environment is very much off the shelf the thing that we're going to is not we're like using a business to help us create it we're basically just trying to copy what we're currently doing and move it into one space it's a journey um you, so even something like so like you know we've got a marketing crm a, an advice crm um you know we've got something for tasks you know if you're trying to manage tasks between advisors and staff you know we've got something for for client proposals we've got digital like software to to get data from clients you know if you're asking a client a question you then want that all to link together and act automate you know have an automation element to it so yeah there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in there and you go on these little journeys like um we tried asana and we tried um clickup and currently we're using trello for some of the stuff so sometimes it's not necessarily the best app that has all the features it's kind of like what works for your business and yes it can be time consuming but yeah how do you we're, we're trying to deal with the and uh, there's a lot of maps out there for it but this so we, we use x plan as the main x plan's our everything uh, so okay. we're well and truly embedded into x plan but it's Trying to get information from the clients into X Plan. There's, you know, there's different different things that we've looked at, and I've been too much involved with it. And other people say, "Oh no, that one wasn't any good, or this one wasn't any good." And then the X Plan one that they have looks atrocious, and yeah, that's a um, that's a challenge. My we've got. official answer for you is we use digital software to get some of that data. So you might do a mini fact find or whatever it is for a client, and we just use Typeform where you just go, "Here is a." Here's 10 questions, answer them. Um, we use humans to do that transition. So of all the things we've done and all the things we've automated, there's a human element of transposing data across because, you know, the husband and the wife gave you a, a mortgage figure, but is it one mortgage figure or is it times two? They're giving you a salary, but is that including or not including, you know, um, SG? There's just these little things that we've had difficulty overcoming and until the solution's perfect, you, you just don't want to go to an 80% solution. Yeah. So, that of all the steps, that's the one bit that we do have humans. Interesting doing. Interesting that you, that you say that. And so, the, the 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 going from the six apps down to the one, that's something that you've got a, a, a business helping you try and build something for that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And will that, will that be as part of, will other advisors that are using your licensing, have, will they have access to yeah. that after you've got it up and running? We are definitely the guinea pig for a lot of this stuff. The business that we use was like our automations business. So you would have heard of like Zapier. Yep. There are other things out there that are just far more um, malleable than Zapier. So Make is one that we've used. And you can, instead of connecting two apps, you can connect three or four. So you might go take in from Typeform, put it into a Google Sheet, from a Google Sheet, putting it into a PDF, from a PDF, put it into an email, send that email to two or three spots. Like you can have multiple step automations. And yeah, we just went back to them and said, hey, you know, We've got all this stuff going on. Do you have a solution where we can just reduce some of this stuff? Um, and the the project we're working on is on a licensee level and on a business, like a you know advice business level. But they're like modules. Um, so yeah, just think of something like PyDrive or any of this sort of stuff. But you can just customize it a bit more to the financial planning world. Um, you know, like I don't. Everyone's advice process is very similar. Data gathering, research, strategy, SOA. You know. Like a lot of that stuff, I think we can copy and paste across, but we're just going to be the guinea pigs. And I think that's the issue with, sorry, with scaling and a, a single advisor doing it his way, his or her way. You don't need processes. You don't necessarily need automation. It's just a, it's just a bit of a clunky process. When you start adding in admin staff or implementation staff or power planners, the bigger you get, the more of this structure that you need. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What do you, what do you think the biggest opportunity is for you in, in the advice business? Uh, endless opportunities. <laughs> it, it's pretty ridiculous. I think probably one of the biggest problems we have is deciding where we spend our time. You know, yeah, it's that's a, it's a pretty big question. Well, yeah, we've got lists and lists of things we could be doing, but you just got to pick and choose. And then say what follow up was that? What you, what's your biggest challenge? But it sounds like there's yeah en- endless opportunity. But uh, what do you focus on first? I think it's your goal. I know this is super cliche. From a um, talking about financial advisors and using goal based whatever, but I think it's the same. Every 
six months, myself and Ben sit down and do business planning. And we sort of say, hey, well, what is our goal for the next six months? What are we trying to do here? And then you work backwards from that. Are you trying to increase cash flow? Are you trying to increase the value of the business? Are you trying to get an extra day off per week? Like, depending on what you're actually trying to do, you you would go backwards. I think when you first start out as an advisor, cash flow is one of the biggest things. But one of the reasons to be self-employed is either to grow a book and grow the value in the background or have flexibility to have time. So, the the, the two decisions that business would make would be very different. So, I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, it but, does. And, it, and yeah. it's, it's an interesting point that you make that fun, in lots of conversations I have with financial advisors, they're all sitting in front of a client. It's, yeah, well, you know, why are you trying to do this thing? What, like, what's the outcome? Okay, and then let's work backwards. But then forget to just apply that exact same approach to the operations of their business. And we have the same conversations in here. So, well, you know, should we do this thing or should we do that thing? So, well, what are we, where are we actually trying to get to first? And, and then we'll yeah. work out, should we go this way or should we go that way? Yeah. It's just following that same process. Same with staff, like, you know, you, having, you know, check-ins and reviews or, you know, um, career progression plans with, with your staff is trying to understand, well, what is it that you actually want to do with your career? And then let's work back to how do we support you to to do that. Yep. yep. Just kind of rinse and repeat the same process we use for clients for every other yep. element of the business as well. Yeah. We have a lot of these, like like that's the common theme. So we look, see our advisors on the licenses more like business partners. And I think they see us the same way. So as soon as they are going to do something, I want to add a staff member, I want to change software, I want to buy a book or whatever it is. They tend to come to us first and sort of say, hey, guys, what's your opinion on this? And again, our answers are different. Some advisors are looking for efficiencies. But it's like, well, why? Well, I'm trying to see my kids more. Or, oh, you know, we have another business who wants to have 50 advisors in their business. They're just, you know, that business is going to invest 10 grand a month on software where the other business is going to say, well, like, no, I just want more time. How do I just get yeah. more time in this process? And what's the um, best way to get to that goal? You're in an interesting, interesting spot. Thanks for yeah. It, it's it's for super sharing. interesting and it's super exciting and um like I don't know. There's just so much opportunity in the industry at the moment that I think advisors do get blinded by the noise a bit. You know, licensing fees and compliance. Um, yeah, just trying to step back a bit. I think is what a lot of us need to do. Yeah, and I I, I like that you've that you've done that over a period of time at the advice business and then built the business yeah. around and just kind of stepped out to you know obviously to, to do what you want to do you're probably doing that yeah that same exercise yourself I'll, I'll add one last thing as well is like you, you hear these advisors and you might hear me talking this way or other things and it, it can almost be daunting when you see these advisors with these big businesses you're like well how am i going to get from here to there it's a lot slower and a lot longer than you think it is so like i think the advisor you know just try to become self-employed like it's a five-year six-year journey it's it's just not going to happen overnight um, all the systems we have, I couldn't do that in a week. It takes years of plugging and trying and switching and like it's a, there's a process to this stuff. So, don't let what other people are doing kind of hinder your own personal growth. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll finish off, kind of circle back to the uh, the advisor games uh, thing uh, yep. that we are talking about right at the start. You mentioned there's some uh, Melbourne one and a, and a Sydney event ca- coming up. Is there some type of like can others register to go along? Yeah, like if I no, was I'm in Melbourne, oh, that, that looked like fun. How how do I yep. get involved? So so just jump along? onto our our website, which is theadvisorgames.com.au. Um, I, it's literally my job today, tomorrow, to actually put those other two events on. But we just yeah. have a if you want to be a sponsor, register here. If you want to be a, a, a participant, register here. So do that on our website. And the other thing I'd also encourage is it's like a team sport. So if you just want to go on a team with someone else, just register. But if you have your whole office and you wanted to go, hey, we want five people to come and we want, we want to call our team, whatever it is, and compete as a team, That it can be your own team building exercise. We capped the numbers on the last one at 50, but I think now that we've done one, we're open to expanding it and making yeah. it a bit bigger. Um, and I think Melbourne is going to be an interesting um, location because you've got like trams and a bit better public transport and, um, you know, and we've just done this one before. We've got some pretty cool ideas for the next one. Yeah, we could. Look, I'm going to register and I'll give a couple of other people. But yeah, good. We're, we're small business or big business, but uh, it, it's great to just. I, I find the bigger the business gets and the business I work in, you know, reasonable size, it, it's very easy to just kind of get trapped in your four walls of that business. Yep. There, there are plenty yep. of other people here to talk to and bounce ideas off, but you get an, in, an insulated view of the world. Whereas uh, 
that these types I, of I things can like, be helpful. Yeah, some of the questions you've asked, like, hey, what software do you use for this? Like, just that, just that conversation, I could talk to you for 45 minutes on. And that's kind of why <laughs> I've given you this high level, hey, this is what we do. But, you know, you kind of need these events or you need to spend time with people and other businesses to drill into the detail. I think the detail is the bit that's really important. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for joining me. Anyway, um, thanks like for having me. Cross paths with you in, uh, in Sydney if you're going to the Ensemble event coming up or uh, the advisor games down here in Melbourne in March. All right, we'll see you, mate. We'll see Good if we can get you holding up that cup at the end as the winner. <laughs> Go for goals. Get my photo on LinkedIn. Thanks for That's joining it. me. Appreciate it. Thanks, mate.